Welcome back to another episode of the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach to health. Uh, today, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. So, Kyle, what are we going to be doing today? We're going to go over the supplements that we personally like. Um, this does not mean that these are supplements that everybody should take, and it's a relatively long list. Um, as most people know, we are fans of optimal health and also individualized health. And, um, you know, this goes with the caveat that lifestyle interventions and the lifestyle pillars are the most powerful interventions in your health. So these supplements are only additional tools to help you get there. Yeah, agree. It's always going to come down to the lifestyle pillars and then supplementation can be a good tool to expedite your progress or move certain things in the right ranges or right directions. So um, people ask us all the time, well, what supplements do you take or what supplements should I take? So we're not going to be giving any individualized advice, but we'll talk about supplements that we have taken, we both taken, um, and that we do frequently recommend for patients in certain cases. So I think one of the most popular supplements out there overall is fish oil, and omega-3s. So maybe we start by breaking down you know, the different omega-3s and then you know, talk about the different types of fish oil um, because there's EPA heavy, DHA heavy. Um, and mm -hmm. fish oil is not completely risk-free. Uh, it does have a good safety profile, but not completely risk-free. So what are the different omega-3s? Can I just eat a bunch of ALA and get my omega-3 requirement in? Probably not. Um, the main ones that you're looking at in fish oil is EPA and DHA. DPA is also an omega-3. But usually you're looking at both the ratio and the absolute content of how much EPA and how much DHA. Um, they also have different risk profiles. For example, if you take usually a prenatal omega-3 is very high in DHA, which helps with neural development um, and is a good addition to most prenatal vitamins. And then often a omega-3, for example, like hypertriglyceridemia, the extreme example of being like pure EPA would be more for um, addressing high triglycerides and is potentially more of a blood thinner as well. Yeah, with the EPA in particular, that's the one that I see get a lot of attention. Um, EPA, like monotherapy, if you will, mm -hmm. um, looking at decreasing inflammation, improving um, depression. And in some studies, usually it has to be a fairly robust dose, like you know, four grams of EPA. Mm -hmm. um, but then as you pointed to, that's also where you see the risks start to occur. So it gives you the best cardiovascular risk reduction in terms of an omega-3. Um, if I'm looking at all the tools available to reduce cardiovascular risk, you know, fish oil is probably not the foundation of therapy, um, mm -hmm. but it can move things in the right direction. You do see some benefit in primary prevention in a couple of trials. There has been some controversy with the placebo, which was a mineral oil, which it's speculated may be harmful, but then other people have gone back and said, no, it's not harmful. Populations just get less healthy over time. Yeah. Um, so that's something I've been following I think is interesting. Um, and the DHA, we've looked at a study of this with um, head injuries in particular. Um, mm -hmm. Football players, um, neurofilament light chain, NFL. Um, this is actually, you know, not NFL football, but just a, a coincidence that happens sometimes in science we really like to see. Uh, but if you have someone um, supplementing with DHA at about a two gram dose, that appears to be the most effective for reducing markers of something like a head injury. Um, and this was done not in NFL players, but in university football players, uh, American football, that is. Mm -hmm. Other things that we'd like to make note of is we're a big fan of objective data. So get your omega check. There's omega checks in the serum and intracellular omega checks. So intracellular is more like an A1C where you can't study for the test to make your omegas look good. So get those and then dose accordingly. If you're going to take over-the-counter omegas, a good rule of thumb is without the supervision of a physician, you don't want to take more than about two grams of EPA or DHA. Um, it's not a strict cutoff, but after that, you might want to at least have a physician's oversight regarding the risk profile. There's also a couple different forms of over-the-counter omega-3s. Um, in general, it's a good idea to have a lower fish oil content that is not omega-3. It'll decrease things like belching, heartburn. Um, often the non-belching versions are just versions that have less um, inactive ingredient or inactive oil in it. And then furthermore, um, there's two main forms, triglyceride form and ethyl ester form. Um, there's not necessarily a superior form, but just keeping in mind the um, 
pharmacokinetics of anything attached to an ethyl ester is important. Yeah, and you'll hear that where people will present the triglyceride form as the only way to get your omega-3 index up. And it really just goes back to the objective data. So get your omega-3, ideally red blood cell index, so that you know with a little bit more, um, more correlation of what's going to be in the tissue levels, the red blood cell test seems to determine that a little, or the red blood cell test seems to indicate that a little bit more than just what's floating around in the serum at a given time. If I go have salmon for dinner and check it the next day, that's, you know, as you mentioned, studying for the test. So I would expect to see the serum omega-3 index come back much higher than what is actually there. I think that's a pretty good summary of omega-3 supplementation. Um, thousand foot view is, yes, it's both prescribed and supplement. There's different forms. But at the end of the day, following objective data and finding what is best for your risk benefit profile. Yeah, I think that's a good summary. So like, take home, who is this supplement potentially for that's been studied in you know, depression, been studied in cardiovascular prevention. Um, one thing we didn't mention was it may have a little bit of an anti-catabolic effect in women. Um, so those are kind of the, you know, the target groups we look at. Um, and then we know that there is quite a bit of correlation with having a good omega-3 index and a good health span. Mm -hmm. Any other populations you think may specifically benefit from omega-3s or fish oil? Those populations which tend to run higher in triglycerides, some of this is just your genetics. Um, in addition, um, there is some types of fats that are known as fat burners, often omega-6s. Most people in developed countries don't need more omega-6s. <laughs> now there is some individuals, like um, some people just avoid all omega-6 intake. It's very difficult to do. But um, that's something to keep in mind is your ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s. Fortunately, your omega index calculates that for you. Yeah, I think those are great points. Uh, next up on the list, we have ashwagandha. So this is a, an herb that I think has gotten a lot more attention. You hear people talking about you know, good things about it or people took it and they felt terrible. Um, and there's not just one type of ashwagandha out there, but some of the purported benefits would be um, boosting testosterone, decreasing cortisol. Um, there actually are some data to support um, improving fertility, uh, mm -hmm. semen parameters. The increases in testosterone do not appear to be all that robust, somewhere between you know, 50 to 100 nanogram per deciliter in a male. Um, and they haven't been heavily studied as far as I've seen um, in female populations looking at androgens specifically. Mm -hmm. But who are some of the people that would be looking at seeing whether ashwagandha is a good tool for them? Um, there's actually several different groups. One group is um, the group that has a uh, mental health condition, for example, anxiety or depression, it's potentially useful. Um, ashwagandha is a good example of a substance. And again, just to rehash it, medications and supplements are the same. They both have pharmacodynamic effects. That's what a drug does to the body. You can remember this because pharmacodynamic has a D in it. And then pharmacokinetic effects, how the body metabolizes the active compounds. So with ashwagandha, it can be serotonergic. It's potentially GABAergic as well. So some people take it in the evening. Um, and then also uh, we mentioned its um, cortisol controlling effect and potentially its uh, enzymatic effects as well. So um, depending on the type of ashwagandha, at some point we'll do a deep dive on this because it is a very complicated substance and it's, you can't just say, yes, this form is for everyone. Um, some people have a lot of side effects when they take ashwagandha. Um, I believe we've even talked about this before in podcast with Lucas of Ergogenic Health, but it is one of our favorite, favorite supplements and it is one of the uh, best uh, efficacious supplements, in my opinion. So it kind of got off on a little rabbit trail there. Um, <laughs> but mental health conditions, potentially fertility, natural testosterone optimization, for sure. Hypercortisolism, for sure. Um, potentially even insomnia. Yeah, And since it does seem to modulate or suppress cortisol to some degree, uh, we know that cortisol is catabolic, so does this mean that I should just start slamming ashwagandha when I wake up because that's when cortisol is the highest? <laughs> Definitely not. Um, uh, cortisol is just like melatonin, as a circadian rhythm. Sometimes we get uh, salivary tests or urinary tests or even just serum tests to look at how the cortisol uh, spike and rhythm is compared to how it should be. 
but you would expect a cortisol spike in the morning and then low cortisol in the evening. The way I explain it is cortisol kind of gives you a kick in the butt that causes you to get out of bed, which is good. Yeah, it stresses you, enough, stresses you out enough just enough to wake you up is the way that I've heard it described. And um, I certainly feel like the first hour or two of my day, I do have a bit of alertness, uh, particularly if I don't you know, consume anything food-wise, drink-wise, mm -hmm. uh, as soon as I wake up. So I think that's a pretty good summary of ashwagandha. Uh, I am looking forward to our more detailed podcast on that, so hopefully people stay tuned. Um, next we have Tongkat Ali, which is something that we have uh, discussed extensively in the past, but people still ask a lot of questions about it. Uh, and in terms of populations that could potentially benefit from this, I know we've talked uh, about you know hypogonadal men or men who just want to increase their testosterone for athletic performance, women who want to increase their testosterone for you know, mood or athletic performance. Um, and then there's some theoretical things there with um, the way it acts on estrogen receptors potentially. Mm -hmm. um, I know you had mentioned endometriosis on a yep. podcast we did um, quite a while ago. Um, so what are some of the studies showing as far as what Tonkatali can do and what it can't do? Yeah, so a, a good rule of thumb for Tonkatali is if you're in more of a caloric deficit or you have low insulin, hypoinsulinemic signaling, low IGF-1, then you're a better candidate for Tonkat because it works on many of the same steroidogenesis cascade enzymes as um, insulin and IGF-1. So that's one reason, like let's take an extreme example, a natural bodybuilder who's really dieted down to very low body fat. They have um, not very much glucose, not very much insulin, not very much IGF-1, perhaps not very much growth hormone either, at least longitudinally averaged over time. If they're fasting for a long time, then they can have some growth hormone spikes but they're a better candidate for Tonkat. If you have a very high SHBG, then you're likely a better candidate for Tonkat because it can help lower very high SHBGs, but it appears not to change normal SHBGs. And then just the, the lower your baseline testosterone and the lower your baseline steroid synthesis, the more likely Tonkat is to help. We've mentioned several studies, for example, the study from Indonesia that says that the Malaysian Tonkat is contaminated with heavy metals. Um, so I'd say, just to be safe, get Indonesian Tonkat for now. We've mentioned the Yuri peptide or Yuri cominone content and the saponin content before. We'll do a deep dive, another deep dive into this in the future. But I believe we just released a podcast that has a relatively deep dive on different Tonkat Ali preparations. Most recently, there was a, I think it was a YouTube video about a new study. There's always going to be studies regarding toxicity and whatnot. When you're talking about testosterone optimization supplements, Many of them upregulate enzymes just in the body. Fidoja um, kind of does this differently with alkaline phosphatase and um, gamma glutamyl transferase, ALKFOS and GGT. Whereas if you're on very, very high doses, then it is more likely that you'll have an excessive upregulation of those substances. Think of it as your cells are more efficient, so efficient that potentially your body could um, have a regulatory mechanism to where it tells itself it does not need as many cells. So there's, there's a difference between toxicity leading to like a necrosis of a cell, for example, versus autophagy. Yeah, the body is very good at these different <clears throat> regulatory mechanisms. So if you look at, you know, your car, you can't just, you know, sit there in neutral and rev the engine to 10,000, 12,000, 14,000 RPMs. And it's very difficult for you to do that, you know, to overclock your body's systems using things that are you know more you know natural supplements now there are some things that are more potent you, you know certainly the dose can make the poison with any compound um, probably true you know definitely true for fedosia in animal models um, there may be something there in human models we just don't have the data to say for sure mm -hmm. um, but as far as you know ton and what we've seen I think irrespective of the increases in testosterone, um, I've seen people who have really good anecdotal you know, experiences. They get their mojo back, uh, quote unquote. And mm -hmm. then um, sometimes we do see some really extreme examples of testosterone levels going way up. I think mm -hmm. probably the most extreme case, something like a, a 300 to a 900. But of course, when we look at someone um, as a, a patient, we can't just you know say, well, don't change anything else. You know, keep keep staying up. Don't work on sleep. Um, you know. Definitely don't get any sunlight. Um, just take this and we want to see what this does. 
Um, that's something that the studies are a little bit better at is looking at you know an individual variable, but there's always going to be confounders. Um, and especially when people are you know, taking Tonkatali, and a lot of times they may be using it just as you described mm -hmm. in a calorie deficit. So you may not actually see an increase. Let's say you start, you check your blood work, you start a calorie deficit, and then you're taking Tonkatali, and you check your blood work and your testosterone level, level hasn't changed. You don't really know how much it would have decreased just because of decreased calories. And I think the nuance here is, you know, if somebody is overweight or has obesity, then they do stand to benefit. Their testosterone levels will go up if they mm -hmm. cut calories. But if somebody is, you know, let's say normal BMI or underweight, then their calorie decrease is going to have an adverse effect on their hormone production. Mm -hmm. So it just goes back to, as we always say, you know, individualizing the plan for the patient. That's a good summary. Um, shall we talk about CoQ10 next? Yeah, CoQ10, there's you know, ubiquinol and ubiquinone. Um, they both say that they're better than the other one, so I'm not sure what I should take. Yeah. Um, there's also, to make it more complicated, several different branded versions of CoQ10. So I, I believe there's at least three different patented or um, like registered trademarked um, ubiquinols. And they each have their own studies on them. Most of the studies are funded or executed along with whatever supplement company patented it or along with whatever um, you know, um, basically ingredient company patented it. So in general, we like ubiquinol over ubiquinone. It doesn't necessarily mean you can't have a mix. There are several different ways to improve absorption, and a lot of the studies are based upon serum levels after absorption. Of course, what matters is getting into the cell or getting intracellular, and there's not great data on this, but a good rule of thumb is to go for a ubiquinol product um, it doesn't necessarily matter which branded product you use. The branded products which supposedly have higher absorption um, are, have usually higher price to where the offset difference or the value is roughly the same. Some people's GI system tolerates a form of ubiquinol better one than the other. Um, so it kind of depends. We have patients on all different forms of ubiquinol. Yeah, and that's a great point. You may be able to take 300 milligrams of a you know ubiquinone, whereas taking 100 milligrams of ubiquinol, and really it goes back to the objective data again. So a serum CoQ10 test is pretty cheap. Um, yep. You know, it may not be something that your you know, primary care can order. Um, maybe not something you want to get um, if you are going to try to run that through insurance, because it yep. it may not be covered. Uh, it's likely not covered. But if you are, especially for people who are taking a statin medication, which does yep. deplete CoQ10 levels, um, I have all of those patients on CoQ10 because if something is being depleted um, and it's, it plugs into that you know, um, cellular energy cycle, the Krebs cycle, then it's probably a good idea to replace that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in our next supplement here. But uh, yeah, just check the levels. I, I think I've seen studies where ubiquinone and ubiquinol are pitted head to head and they both increase the blood levels significantly, uh, the ubiquinol does seem to increase them slightly more. So it is a little bit more potent. Kind of reminds me of nicotinamide riboside versus nicotinamide mononucleotide. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing to talk about too, uh, with the separation between you know, drugs and supplements because you know, NMN or beta NMN seems to be uh, being developed as a drug now. Um, and I don't know all the circumstances surrounding on this. Perhaps we can come back and comment when I'm a little bit better informed, but something for people to look into. Um, let us know your thoughts on, will the FDA ban beta in Yeah, um, I think that it, they will at least consider it. Um, of note, ubiquinol or CoQ10 was also investigated, I believe in combination with a statin, and it did not make it through FDA clinical trials. So. We will see if NMN makes it through um, clinical trials. Yeah, I believe that was a, a Merck product that had the statin and CoQ10 mm -hmm. uh, combined into one. Uh, and the idea was, you know, patients with heart disease have a lot of comorbidities. You know, talking about 
atherosclerosis, you know, hence the indication for a statin. Yep. A lot of these patients will develop heart failure and could benefit from CoQ10, mm -hmm. which in some studies at higher doses does show that it improves your ejection fraction. Now, mm -hmm. if you have normal cardiac function, is it going to make your heart you know, twice as efficient? Probably not. Very unlikely. Another note about CoQ10, and for that matter, NMN, nicotinamide riboside, and even creatine as well, and carnitine, it is just a tool. So if you are an individual, even if you have heart failure, even if you have severe arthralgias and myalgias, the less you move, the less it's going to help you. Because you actually have to spend that mitochondrial, mitochondrial energy and deplete NAD more and more. Another term of, of this, and one of the pathologies that um, some of these things treat is called NAD depletion myalgias. So the less you're depleting your ATP and thus NAD+, plus, the less that you're going to benefit from things like coenzyme Q10. Yeah, I think that's a great thing for people to think about. Uh, another example is, you know, CoQ10 and improving insulin sensitivity in diabetes. So somewhere between 100 and 200 milligrams has shown some modest effects on improving insulin sensitivity. But if I have someone with diabetes or even pre-diabetes, I am definitely going to prescribe exercising, a combination of yep. resistance training and aerobic work, before I would say, you know, don't worry about it, just take the CoQ10, because while that may be helpful for them, it's going to be you know, a very small benefit in comparison to what consistent exercise can do. So exercise is medicine, and a replacement for that is not just taking carterine <laughs> and NMN at a high dose. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they can ever develop pharmaceuticals that mimic the effects of exercise. Um, I'm quite skeptical, but mm -hmm. I do like to remain optimistic. Yeah. When there is a pharmaceutical or supplement or peptide, when there is a substance with pharmacologic effects on the body that supposedly mimics exercise, cancer or excess of energy and excess of growth signaling is usually the concern, especially with low amounts of exercise. I think that's good for CoQ10. And up next we have vitamin D. Um, we kind of lump this together with vitamin D and K2 because we are often uh, having people take both of these together, particularly in the case of statin use. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those interesting things where you, you see a paradoxical effect with statins and an increase in vascular calcification, which is good because it stabilizes unstable plaques. Mm -hmm. Um, but ideally, you don't have any calcification. So you, it's kind of a you know, double-edged sword there. And potentially, vitamin K is something that plays a role here. So uh, vitamin K2 is depleted, if you will, um, just like CoQ10 in people who are on statin therapy. And again, I think it's a good idea to replace those things, especially with some of the data that shows vitamin K2 can improve your basically vascular flexibility. So mm -hmm. the ability of those arteries to contract and dilate. Um, there was a trial that failed looking at um, aortic calcification. Vitamin K2 did not seem to have a beneficial effect there. Um, but it doesn't appear to have harmful effects either. Not to say that no one can have a side effect from vitamin K2, but um, you know, it seems to have a fairly good safety profile, uh, just like vitamin D, but there's also risks with vitamin D. So mm -hmm. should everybody be taking vitamin D? Should everybody be taking vitamin K2? Or who are the people who stand to benefit the most from those? As always, we're a fan of checking objective markers in your labs. And we will post lab panels and such on our website at some point with all these things, CoQ10, I mean, even carnitine, um, vitamin K2 as well, in addition to vitamin D, which I think most people interested in health optimization check regularly. But a bad candidate for K2 would be um, potentially someone who is on a medication where you're not supposed to take vitamin K with it. Or if you go to like, a, for example, an anticoagulation clinic, um, talking to that specialist about vitamin K because it is both uh, it's involved in protein C and protein S and other coagulation factors, so it can both um, lead to bleeding and clotting depending on like the timing that you're taking it. So if you have one of those predispositions, that's when to consider um, your vitamin K intake more closely. Uh, and vitamin D, you know, people can check this quite easily. Um, I think insurance does pick up this one on occasion, although 
um, based on my providers that I've talked to, you, you do have to change the ICD-10 every once in a while because they stop covering for you know, vitamin use. Now it has to be long-term medication use or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but you can also get it um, from a self-service lab company quite cheaply. Yep. And there's different levels of vitamin D that correlate with a sufficient level, a deficient level, and a insufficient level. So mm -hmm. when we're looking at a vitamin D level below 20, that's typically defined as you know, a deficient level. Below 30 is insufficient, and then anywhere between, typically it's 30 and 100 is considered a sufficient level. Mm -hmm. um, but what do the data tell us about the level, and should someone be at 31 and they're good to go, nothing to worry about, or should somebody have their level at 200, just get it as high as they possibly can? Yeah, so vitamin D, it can be over 100, but if you're using like sunlight and diet to get it to let's say 130, then I'm gonna have less concern than if you're just using supplementation to get it there. Vitamin D, D, A, K, and E. So cake with a D are your fat soluble vitamins and they all can potentially have toxicity because they build up in high levels. That's why if you eat, a, for example, a bear liver, then um, it can potentially be toxic. I think particularly polar bear livers but I could be wrong. Um, polar bears are mostly carnivorous and they have higher uh, intake of fat soluble, fat soluble vitamins, but not to get off onto too much of a tangent. Um, the um, vitamin D intake I consider optimal range would be around 40 to 100. So I, if I was 31, then I'd say definitely supplement. There's some studies, um, there's lots of studies on vitamin D out there, but I think there's some pretty good ones that show improved immunity at a level of 40 or more. Some physicians say 50 to 100, for example, in a patient with osteoporosis. Yeah, and if somebody has a like, family history of autoimmune disease, this is another area that we see vitamin D having some association with the reduced incidence. So, you know, let's say something like Hashimoto's, very common. A female patient comes in, you know, mom, you know, about my age, developed Hashimoto's. Well, we can check those you know, antibodies, you know, check the thyroid labs, but then also pushing up the vitamin D level closer to that high end around 100 could potentially be better than if it's just at, let's say, 31 and you're sufficient. Um, another thing is it seems that when you push that level across a threshold of 50, uh, that you have an improvement in athletic performance. And again, it's not going to be better than just consistent training and progressive overload. But this was noted in, I believe, some European countries where they saw variations in athletic performance depending on the time of year and then the sunlight exposure. And we know that sunlight does trigger that cascade and uh, help with the vitamin D synthesis. Yep. There's been a couple trials that have looked at this. They've looked at soccer players and their vertical jump. They've looked at um, judo um, contestants or combatants. I'm not sure what the right term is there. And their isometric strength. And they do see some you know, statistically significant changes, but again, it's a fairly small effect size. Um, and a great example of this, something that I used to think was, you know, vitamin D, very protective for pancreas, pancreatic beta cells. Uh, and I was actually misinterpreting that study. When I went back and looked at it, it was just one small, um, I believe it was the hyperglycemic insulin clamp uh, study that they were able to show that it did have a slight effect on the amount of insulin that was able to be produced, something of that nature, statistically significant, but not necessarily clinically significant. Mm -hmm. But then when we look at uh, another study, which I was just glancing over before we started this, you can have something that is not statistically significant, but that seems to be and appears to be very clinically significant. So this was a eight-week trial where they supplemented vitamin D in one group, placebo in the other. Uh, and these weightlifters in the vitamin D group added about nine kilograms, which is you know, almost 20 pounds to their squat. And then the placebo group only added three kilograms to their squat over the same time period. Uh, very big difference, especially for anyone that does you know, compete in powerlifting or has any knowledge about you know, what the difference in, in weights there are. That's significant. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering what the threshold would have been to show a statistically significant effect size. But, somebody have to add 50 pounds for their squat in eight weeks for it to be uh, statistically significant. Mm -hmm. So I think there are some benefits there just related to your muscular function, having the level a little bit higher, but you do want to keep an eye on you know, calcium levels, perhaps mm -hmm. if you have history of kidney stones, you know, uh, 
one of the most painful things people can experience and you definitely don't want to predispose yourself to that. Yep. The athletic benefit and our friend, Dr. Henry, uh, Harvard trained orthopedist, uh, founder of the vitamin D society in Indonesia. Um, he would point out that yes, the benefit from going from 10 to 50 is profound when it comes to athletic performance. The benefit from going to 50 to 100 might not be clinically significant, but it can potentially be helpful. And a lot of times he pushes people to the high normal, just like often we push patients on, for example, TRT that aren't feeling good at a low range testosterone up to the higher normal range as well. Um, and he also points out that just because you're in an area with a lot of sun, like Indonesia or the Southern United States, you should still check a vitamin D, especially because depending on your dermatotype or um, basically how well your skin absorbs vitamin D, then you might tend to run low even with a decent amount of sunlight. Yeah, that's a great point. And I've seen you know, people who work construction in Arizona with uh, insufficient or deficient levels of vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So again, it goes back to get tested, look at the objective data. Um, in the same vein of athletic performance, our next supplement is creatine and specifically creatine monohydrate. Mm -hmm. So uh, creatine, I, I think, is the most studied sports supplement at this point and has a really extraordinary safety profile. There's a little bit of nuance there when you get into people taking um, nephrotoxic or kidney toxic medications. But um, overall, if someone is looking for a way to improve athletic performance, in addition to training, of course, creatine monohydrate seems to be a really good way to do that. Yep. Um, this has got to be the go-to supplement, whether it's athletic performance, even cognitive performance. From a thousand foot view, here's the um, like fast facts on creatine. It's basically a backup fuel tank for your mitochondria. The mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell, so literally more fuel. It does have some hormonal effects. It can increase testosterone, even increase 5-alpha reductase enzyme activity. Um, there's some, a lot of studies on DHT levels before and after creatine. Um, and this helps both the mitochondria in your muscles and the mitochondria in your brain as well. It can also decrease homocysteine levels in individuals that tend to build up homocysteine. For example, if someone has an MTHFR polymorphism. So a ton of benefits from creatine. Um, a few other kind of like uh, common questions is creatine monohydrate is just fine. It does not need to be super creatine. Um, if there is a marginal, likely non-clinically significant benefit to a different form of creatine, then the cost that you will pay for that special branded version of creatine is far higher and you can just take more creatine monohydrate. For example, seven grams or 10 grams instead of five grams. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. You know, five grams is a great dose for probably 90% of people. But if you are really trying to push down homocysteine or if somebody has more lean body mass, you know, a bodybuilder, for example, it's ridiculous to think that someone who's 300 pounds of muscle versus someone who's 100 pounds um, would just both need five grams of creatine. So I think there's a little bit of additional benefit if somebody's taking, you know, 10 grams and they have the muscle mass to you know, process, absorb, and store that. Um, and it does have some new data that's come out, um, something I was never aware of until probably the past year or so, uh, as far as the cognitive effects of creatine, kind of a, a backup fuel source, um, and then some improvements in different cognitive domains like working memory or um, recognition tasks where someone's put into a familiar environment and they kind of you know, pick up and, and go faster than they would otherwise. So it has a couple of interesting benefits and also long-term, because you know, we know that homocysteine is I sometimes call it a neurotoxin, um, but a chronic neurotoxin. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you're supplementing with creatine, keeping the homocysteine, which you should get checked in a optimal range, then you are going to more than likely have less brain atrophy over time. Mm -hmm. I think that sums it up well, one of our favorite, favorite supplements. A um, couple last points on it. Not a major concern for kidney disease, or really not a concern at all. It can just affect your creatinine level that you test. So maybe get a cystatin C if you're going to take creatine through it, or you have a persistently elevated creatinine level. And then it's not a huge concern for dehydration. Um, it, ac it can actually help hydrate cells because water tends to follow creatine when it enters the cell. Yeah, and I think there's just a couple of case reports out there where people with chronic kidney disease taking uh, some of the HIV antiviral medications, you know, mm -hmm. had some questionable things about, you know, did the creatine worsen kidney function? But there's a lot of confounding variables there.
Um, and if somebody does have, you know, like a, a mild chronic kidney disease, um, like you know, stage three, for example, or something like that, you can always look at your cystatin C and see, you know, is that deteriorating um, or is it just the creatinine, as you mentioned, that's going up because of that conversion that happens. So I think that's a really good summary. Um, next we have protein powder, which I put in here because it's kind of a supplement, kind of a food. You know, in a perfect world, you get all the protein and nutrients you need in your diet, um, but protein powder is, or just even ready-made protein shakes are things that um, I do find myself recommending for people for you know, um, satiety, um, for hitting their daily protein requirements uh, and you know, driving that muscle protein synthesis. And of course, there is an upper limit there. Um, you know, you, I don't think anyone should be living off of just six protein shakes a day, uh, but it can be a really good tool, um, especially if we're looking at you know, getting that per meal intake to something like 30 or 40 grams. Maybe someone just needs to you know, drink half of a shake at that first meal of the day that usually doesn't have a lot of protein in it to set themselves up for a, a good intake of protein throughout the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. That's a great summary. Um, I'm a fan of protein shakes just because they're very convenient and they can be a relatively high value as well. So it's not a particularly expensive supplement. Um, even if you take it daily, we mentioned its benefits on satiety. At some point we'll do a deep dive on all proteins as um, you know, medication slash supplements. And I'll mention the risks and benefits and optimal timing of uh, things like a high leucine content proteins, general meat and dairy, and then uh, things like methionine content or ratio of methionine to other proteins. So just like we discussed uh, different, some different uh, fats when we talked about omega-3s and omega-6s, the same thing can be said for protein, the same thing can be said for fiber, the same thing can even be said for carbohydrates. Yeah, I think that'll be a really exciting discussion to have because you've kind of seen these two sides emerge where one side is very pro-protein, there's no such thing as too much protein, and then there's another side that is, you know, I guess taking it to the other extreme where they're doing you know, protein restriction. And you know, like with most things, I think there is a middle ground there where you can, you know, as you mentioned, manipulate perhaps leucine or the amount of methionine, you know, time of day. Um, and, and get the benefits of adequate protein, lean body mass, and then also you're not um, potentially accelerating aging, I think is really what it comes down to, the, mm -hmm. the concern there. So um, maybe we tease a little bit about that with, uh, you know, casein protein is another type of protein, and um, that can actually um, spike prolactin levels, um, which I was not aware of until probably a couple years ago. Um, but it, it is a mild, you know, um, opiate agonist. Um, it can cause your pituitary to put out a little bit more prolactin. Probably not significant for most people, but if some people are particularly sensitive to uh, dairy or the casein mm -hmm. in dairy, um, then that can happen. Yep. That being said, people should not necessarily stop eating casein. It's also one of our favorite proteins because it's one of the best for satiety. There's kind of this misnomer that you can't consume more than 30 grams of protein at one time. Um, but the longer your protein digests, so when you're thinking about uh, intaking of any nutrient, don't just think about the time of when you put it in your mouth. So you can put, let's say, a full meal with eggs, meat, a full breakfast, omelets, and a casein protein shake, and it could be 90 grams or 100 grams of protein, and that casein will digest very slowly. Whereas a faster digesting protein, or a protein that is not as bioavailable, might not be um, taken into cells as easily. So that's one of the great things about casein. In general, we're fans of consuming casein early in the morning because it actually has a lot of content of, for example, BCAAs or leucine, which can activate mTOR. So there's a lot of cognitive dissonance and in, like an individual that wants to have a huge casein shake before bed, but then at the same time, they're worried about their mTOR, PI3K, AKT system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even thinking of the composition of your meals in terms of the amount of dietary fat, that's going to slow the absorption. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm really excited to come back and revisit that one. Um, L-carnitine, this is one that has been around forever, but again, over the past couple of years, I think it's gotten a new spike in interest. And the biggest thing I think of with this one is, you know, is we've discussed the androgen receptors in the past, and then also 
looking at your you know, exercise performance, so the workload, and then I think part of that has to do with the perceived effort. Um, you know, I think it does have some activity on the, the D2 or D3 receptors. I can't remember off the top of my head which ones. Um, but for myself, I think that I do experience that. I'll take some L-carnitine uh, before I'm going to do something that I, I don't like to do, uh, like going for a run. And then it seems to me that it is you know, much easier or much less bad than I anticipated. So whether that's placebo or whether the L-carnitine is actually doing that, something that I plan to continue. Um, and I think it's you know, something that I've seen other people anecdotally see mm -hmm. and then some data to support. You get a little bit more um, work production out of a given training session. Mm -hmm. This effect seems particularly strong for injectable L-carnitine because it has a low bioavailability. If you inject it, then it has a much, much higher bioavailability, of course. Often it's as low as 10% for oral L-carnitine. And then if you inject it, you also get uh, occasionally that little bit of a sympathetic drive to help it. And a lot of people anecdotally report that they get they feel warm, not quite to the level of like meat sweats to where if they eat at a Brazilian steakhouse, but they definitely feel more warm. So a great use for it as far as just um, quality of exercise is if it's cold outside, like in the winter right now, and you're gonna go for a jog or exercise outdoors in the morning when it's particularly cold. Um, it's one of my favorites in those situations. Yeah, I think that's a, a good way for it to be deployed um, because that way you're getting the benefits of the you know, carnitine as a supplement itself and then also harnessing that around the times of your training. Mm -hmm. um, and dosages, you know, they do vary. Uh, it may be something like several grams of L-carnitine if you're looking, taking an oral supplement mm -hmm. or something like 250 to 500 milligrams if you're using the injectable form, which as you mentioned is much more bioavailable. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a bro science. Um, not to get too off in the weeds, that anything under about 300 milligrams injectable has no efficacy for L-carnitine. And of course, there's no like specific point where it's unefficacious and then efficacious. That's just where some of the studies have a cutoff. Um, often, the when you do inject it, um, obviously talk to your doctor about it, but um, the first couple, if you're going to use a high volume, like one mil of 500 mix per mil, will sting a bit more for the first three to five injections. So sometimes it's best to start off with low dose, that way you can actually tolerate it. And it gets you a, it, it's just one of those substances with low bioavailability where a different mechanism of administration is just gonna give you far more bang for the buck. Yeah, and I think that's a good point about, you know, there's nothing magical that happens when you go from 299 to 301 milligrams. Just like uh, if you've got somebody who has you know, low testosterone, 299, let's say, and then say, oh yeah, well, we'll recheck it and make sure that it's actually low. It comes back at 301, and then the urologist says, oh, look, you're cured. Um, that person in reality probably doesn't feel any different at 301 mm -hmm. versus 299. Yep. Um, one other thing about uh, L-carnitine is going back to the analogy of the mitochondria being the powerhouse of the cell or the engine. So we talked about how creatine's the backup fuel tank NAD, NMN, those are the substrate, or that's the actual fuel that converts to ATP. CoQ10 is the catalyst or the coenzyme that converts it. So that's like the, um, uh, you know, the fuel booster, if you will, octane booster is CoQ10. The actual fuel is the NMN or NAD. And then how L-carnitine fits in is it's the fuel pump. So it makes the shunting of energy into the mitochondria, particularly with uh, fatty acids. And it's called the carnitine palmitial coenzyme A shuttle. It makes it very efficient. So it's like a race car fuel pump. Yeah, and you know, going back to the CoQ10 and then also when you add something like you know, L-carnitine to that, now, these are things that are frequently you know, recommended as adjuncts in a fertility protocol mm -hmm. just because you know, there's you know, mitochondria in the testes, mitochondria in the ovaries. Um, and helping to you know, turn up those a little bit and then suppress some of the oxidative stress or oxidative damage there is something that you know, has, has actually been studied and we see improvements mm -hmm. in you know, um, you know, semen volume, semen uh, sperm parameters like the motility, uh, morphology, all those things seem to improve whenever you give yourself more um, oxidative stress support and then more mitochondrial energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it very well might <coughs> be as simple as spermatozoa flagella require energy. And during meiosis and also during uh, crossing over, 
of uh, all of those cellular processes forming the spindle, et cetera, et cetera, that all requires energy. You gotta have um, mitochondria making that energy. That's just the most efficient way to do it with the utilization of your L-carnitine race car fuel pump. Yeah, love that analogy. Um, another L supplement here, um, L-tyrosine. Uh, and this is one that has, you know, again, gotten popular over the past year or two, um, but it's been around for a long time, um, and it's something that is a precursor to dopamine. Um, so I put this in the bucket of not necessarily even dopaminergic supplements, but dopaminergic substances. So, you know, we know that there's a number of things that are dopaminergic, whether it's medications, uh, hormones like testosterone, or supplements like L-tyrosine or eucinopurines, but L-tyrosine seems to be fairly reliable and it is, has a number of studies out there you know, looking at um, different cognitive functions and how people respond to this. So, you know, why would someone want to increase their dopamine? Aren't they gonna become addicted or something? So there's a, a couple different ways to look at increasing dopamine. If you're providing substrate for your body's natural synthetic pathway, then you're not going to overwhelm the receptor. Dopamine receptors are like this and GABA receptors are also notorious for this. It is um, the desensitization of the receptor. So if you take a very heavily dopaminergic substance, say cocaine, or if you take a very heavily GABAergic substance, say a benzodiazepine like Xanax, you're very quickly, or even alcohol, you're very quickly gonna change the sensitivity of that receptor. Um, sometimes I make the analogy called the dopamine wave pool. And I know uh, Dr. Huberman also likes to talk about this, where the, the caveat is, you know, your dopamine can increase and decrease just like waves in a wave pool. If you use something that is too dopaminergic, your wave is gonna go over the surface, it's gonna splash out, and then after that, to make things even worse, the bottom of the pool is gonna get deeper as well. So then you need even more dopamine to have that same effect. Yeah, and you can sort of think of the replenishing, rebalancing, resensitization of your dopamine receptors as just a little garden hose trying to fill up that massive pool. Yep. So you know, for this reason, I think um, a lot of people will use something like L-tyrosine just occasionally because they don't want to, you know, again, kind of you know, overclock the system, um, stimulate those you know, dopamine receptors, give more dopamine on a, a chronic basis. Yep. Uh, now this may be different for someone whose brain operates a little bit differently, um, like someone with ADHD. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they can decrease their need for a, a stimulant medication, decrease the milligram dose, mm -hmm. if you're giving something that's a natural substrate for that downstream dopamine, um, like the L-tyrosine that we're talking about. So uh, I think that's a situation that's a little bit different, but for most people, probably limiting to that limiting it to something like two or three days per week. Um, we'll make sure you're not splashing too much water out of that dopamine wave pool. Mm -hmm. Other things of note with L-tyrosine is it also forms um, other adrenergic molecules, um, some pathoemetics, or just straight um, you know, adrenaline and noradrenaline, which is epinephrine and uh, norepinephrine. And then it also is a substrate for thyroid hormone, so both T3 and T4. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think this is something that could predispose someone to anxiety if they are sensitive to those, you know, sympathetic homemetics or catecholamines that mm -hmm. are going to be synthesized. Yep. Um, next, we have another type of protein, um, collagen protein. I, I did just want to mention this one briefly because it's something that, you know, I use personally and that, you know, lots of people are using, and there's actually some new studies coming out on this. Um, so far, I don't know that they've been replicated, but looking at Things like um, you know collagen protein, and then the collagen in your skin, appearance of fine wrinkles, and then also collagen protein and the strength and uh, cross-sectional area of connective tissue. So, mm -hmm. looking at, I believe, tendons and ligaments, you see a, a increase. Again, this is in response to training. Uh, kind of the theme of the episode is that you know training um, and then supplements may enhance that recovery. And these are very small effect sizes. You know, something like you know, well, you have a 2% increase in cross-sectional area with placebo, maybe a 6% increase in cross-sectional area with the collagen protein supplementation. Mm -hmm. So that's three times as much, but in reality, it's a very small effect size, and it shows that even if you are just training, you're gonna have some adaption or adaptive changes in your connective tissue just as a result of that stimulus. Mm -hmm. Collagen's high, of course, every protein's high, and they have different amino acid profiles. It has a pretty high amount of glycine protein. And there's also some interesting studies on glycine and prevention or 
amelioration of severity of osteoporosis. In other conditions, many people take it for uh, skin, hair, and nails as well. Some people take it with MSM or even vitamin C for cross-linking. But one of the biggest arguments for collagen protein is if you're already taking a protein supplement, why not have part of that be collagen protein? Yeah, I think that's a good uh, good way to look at it. And glycine is you know, exceptionally safe. It's been studied at very, very high doses um, and it primarily looking at the how high of a dose is going to correlate with how much of a growth hormone spike. Um, so that's something we see people do a lot of times before bed. They'll take some glycine um, and have some really good sleep quality mm -hmm. um, improvements in you know, sleep architecture, uh, sleep latency, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then we have probiotics, which could probably be an episode of its own yep. because there are many different types of probiotic. but. Just assuming we're talking about a broad spectrum probiotic, um, you know, everyone is you know thinking about gut health now, the gut brain axis, which I think is great to see more recognition in that area of science. Mm -hmm. But you know, does this mean that everyone needs to be taking a probiotic? Um, you know, how do you improve your gut microbiome, and are, are probiotics the only way to do that? Mm -hmm. Probiotics are one way to do it. Essentially, um, gut microbiome replacement therapy is a way to think of a, a probiotic. Other things like postbiotics or prebiotics or dietary changes or just avoiding antibiotics and giving it time. Um, those are ways to more chronically alter your um, endogenous gut microbiome. There's interesting studies that show, and this is no surprise, if you just take a probiotic, even if it's for a long period of time and then stop, your gut microbiome returns. So that's probably related to your lifestyle, diet, exercise, those all have effects with your gut microbiome. And there's a lot of crosstalk between mucosal microbiomes, skin microbiomes, and your gut microbiome as well. So all that being said, um, the analogy I'll have to make for your gut microbiome, and of course no analogy is perfect, but your gut is like a combined terrarium aquarium. And you have, let's say fish in this aquarium. Those are your um, good microbiota. And then you have your fish food, those are your, like your prebiotics. And then you have kind of fish tank cleaner or products of the microbiota. And those are your postbiotics. You also drain the silt or drain the dirt or clean your tank from time to time. That's having a, a stool. And you don't necessarily want to have a aquarium where you're just adding fish to the aquarium all the time. Sometimes you have to, but Ideally, you would get to a point where you have a good combination of fish food and a tank cleaning or emptying schedule that has uh, a good profile of the good fish and less of the bad fish to where um, you can enjoy eating and not have an overly restrictive diet and get to a point where you're also not consistently adding fish or taking especially a lot of high doses of a um, uh, probiotic. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting way to look at it, um, and it's something that I think people can understand fairly easily about the way that the gut and the bacteria and the microbiome works, and it's really about sustainability. So, you know, you, you certainly don't want a, um, a terrarium that is overfished, um, you know, people taking lots of antibiotics, frequent infections. That's one of the areas where I think it can be very beneficial to add in a probiotic, you know, there's been you know, a number of these studies, and I used to think in the hospitals, like, well, why are all these people with, you know, history of, you know, Clostridium uh, difficile, C. diff, why are they not being put on, you know, Saccharomyces whenever they come into the hospital mm -hmm. because, you know, they're at higher risk for it. Um, and they've done those studies showing that, you know, when you supplement with, in this case, a beneficial yeast, that you mm -hmm. do decrease the, um, the opportunity for that bad bacteria, the C. difficile, to get a foothold in. You know, really, it's not so much about the foothold, but its ability to proliferate and make up a larger percentage of that gut microbiome. So, you know, we know exercise, you know, as little as six weeks, you can see improvements in gut microbiome diversity. So that's yep. really the metric of if you're gonna get a test. You're not necessarily looking at, you know, you don't have to look at anyway, like how many of X species or you know, titers do I have for all these things, but looking at the diversity, because um, a more diverse microbiome is associated with better health, um, but exercise, uh, feeding the gut microbiome with things like fiber, um, fermented foods, it, it does appear to have to be quite a high amount of you know, fermented foods, like five or six servings per day. Mm -hmm. At least it's been studied, but that's not to say that if you're eating 
four servings a day, you're wasting your time because there's nothing magical that happens between four servings and five servings. Yep. One last analogy that I like to use with the terrarium is that your gut is the front line of defense for your immune system. And it's also where your immune system or your body's military runs drills. So the, the analogy with this would be, of course, fishing with a fishing rod or maybe even spear fishing. And you want to have plenty, every good military runs military drills, right? And the gut is where your immune system does that. So if there's not enough fish in the tank to practice spear fishing, then you might crack the side of the tank or injure the side of the tank. That would be an example of like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or a lot of autoimmune diseases might likely develop. There's a lot of correlation studies between antibiotic use and also suboptimal gut microbiota and autoimmune disease, especially um, atopic diseases like allergies, asthma, and eczema, and also inflammatory bowel diseases. So you need that in order for um, basically to have a good direction of where you can direct your military. Also, when an actual bug comes along, an actual like pathologic fish, you want to be able to be good enough to where you can catch that. Yeah, I think that's another good analogy for people. Um, and we see this like sometimes someone will have a random uh, C-reactive protein that's elevated and like, well, why is this elevated? And there's a million things that could be causing that elevation. Mm -hmm. We say, well, well, we'll go ahead and recheck it. If there's no you know, obvious causes like mm -hmm. you know, excess adiposity driving inflammation or being sedentary or uh, a known infection, mm -hmm. then we just recheck. And a lot of times that does come back to normal. But if somebody has a chronically elevated um, C-reactive protein, then we can start to kind of move down that differential and see, okay, where is this coming from? What's driving this consistent elevation? Because we want consistency, but consistency in optimal ranges with you know, good biomarkers. Definitely. Uh, and the last one here is L-citrulline. Um, I suppose we could put L-arginine in the same you know, mm -hmm. nitric oxide category, um, beetroot juice. There's yep. you know, a million different things out there. Um, but L-citrulline appears to be a little bit more effective. Um, it's actually converted mostly to arginine in the gut. So if, if you want to take arginine, you certainly can, and you're going to get an increase in nitric oxide from that. But L-citrulline is going to increase the absolute amount of um, nitric oxide signaling that you're going to get. It's just a more efficient way to get there, uh, milligram per milligram. Mm -hmm. Your body has two main nitric oxide synthesis pathways. Um, L-citrulline is certainly our favorite. Often it's com um, combined with malic acid. Um, where it's a citrulline malate, and it's really the citrulline content that you're looking at. You can dose it relatively high. If you're also on another nitrite, like let's say you're on, a, or something that can affect vasodilation and thus blood pressure, for example, Tadalafil, or an extreme example, if, you're, if you like have nitroglycerin to take from time to time, you certainly want to talk to your doctor about it. It very well might be contraindicated. And then if you're on a slightly lower dose of something like citrulline or nitrosagene, which is a branded one, and you're also on something like beetroot, or um, which I believe has like sodium nitrate and betaine nitrate, actual nitrates um, in them, then you can use a little bit of both and find um, a kind of happy medium where you're able to get enough vasodilation without having uh, side effects like flushing or nausea. Yeah, and you know, looking at you have you know, kind of the the start and the stop. So you have your you know, nitric oxide precursors, nitric oxide synthesis, and then you have your um, phosphos phosphodiesterase that's going to break down that nitric mm -hmm. oxide. So we do know that levels of uh, phosphodiesterase, specifically PDE five, go up as people increase in age. So yeah. you know, you could make the case that you know a lot of people would benefit from a, a tiny dose of a PDE five inhibitor. Mm -hmm. pharmaceutically or at least um, in the long term you know doing things that increase nitric oxide like exercise of course um, and then you know adding in something like l-citrulline which has been studied in quite high doses you know five eight even ten grams in some cases mm -hmm. um, this is one study that I just it jumps out at me and I need to look at the methods a little bit more closely but it's talking about eight grams of l-citrulline and you do 50 percent more reps on bench press so is that that you are you know the placebo group gets two reps, and then the L-citrulline group gets three reps, and that's the difference. Uh, I would suspect so, just because I don't think you're going to get a huge effect size, unless there was some sort of like methodology flaws in the study. 
Mm -hmm. It makes sense. It's like anything else where, um, yes, there is a maximally efficacious dose, but as you approach that, um, and it is certainly true of citrulline um, because it interacts with a lot of different things, your, um, you might only have 10% more benefit, whereas if you had half the dose. Now, um, would a lot of people benefit from a maximally efficacious dose of L-citrulline? Certainly, but it is something that it is actually quite common to see side effects. For example, a, a headache after an orgasm or flushing or even lightheadedness. So if you're doing a max rep deadlift and your blood pressure is dropping, then that might be particularly dangerous. Yeah, that's a great example of when perhaps not to take L-citrulline, or at least for the very first time. Yep. Once you know how you respond to something, it's just like certain medications say, you know, do not operate heavy machinery or drive until you know how the medication affects you. You know, I guess a, a deadlift could be considered some heavy machinery. <laughs> um, so yep. I, I think a lot of supplements, especially ones that are vasodilators like L-citrulline, uh, people should take a, a similar approach and be very careful. You know, take it when you don't have a important task to do or something that would put you at risk for injury the first time. Definitely. I think that's a pretty good summary. So that wraps up our discussion for, day as a, for today. As always, thank you for your time. And we hope that this has helped to give you tools to develop a balanced approach to your health. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Let us know what you liked. Let us know what you didn't like. Let us know your favorite supplements. I think we went over a dozen or so of things that we frequently use ourselves and recommend. So let us know if you like this content and thanks so much for watching.